tak? Morning church, nice to see you guys all here on this glorious Sunday and uh, it's a school holiday time so people are still trickling in and of course the weather is also not that great you know but it is a day God has blessed us with so let us rejoice in his name and let's come together for next hour and a half and shout and sing loudly and praise and worship him today. Well, um, if you've joined us in person, I welcome you. And people on Facebook, if you've joined us online, I welcome you all. If you're visiting here for the first time, I welcome you. If you've joined us for the first time online, I welcome you. And if you are present here in person, it would be an honor to meet you over a cup of coffee or tea, whatever you like, and to have a nice chat, a yarn with you. Well, my name is Sujoy Nandi, and I am here today. I've got a privilege to serve you by leading the service. And I uh, also want to acknowledge Warwick and Colin, who are on piano today, and they'll be leading us in the music. And also, we have uh, Jackie and uh, John. Jackie's on the sound system is uh, sorry on the easy worship and uh, John is on the sound system. Let's pray. Let's come together and pray. Father, may we, as your beloved children, honor you, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the worship of which you are alone worthy. Guide our minds with your word. Fill our hearts with your grace, empower our worship by your spirit. In Christ Jesus, let us all come together and say, Amen. So as we continue with the, our series of uh, living with the presence in the present, soon we will be coming together to read from the scriptures and listen to Donna. Um, as she preaches on this topic, but before that, let's come together and greet each other. And while you're greeting each other, just just be mindful of the COVID requirements. And if you're wearing masks, just keep each other some space. Let us greet each other.
Psalm 19, 1 to 2 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. So let us continue to praise and proclaim the name of our Lord Jesus Christ today and forever in our lives. Let us be seated. Well, it's time to submit our praise to our Lord. And let us pray for three things today. We pray, let's pray for our priest in charge, Lauren, and her husband, Peter. And let's pray for our troubled youth and our youth in this country. And let's pray for our, the financial burden the people are experiencing in this world where life of the cost of living keeps going up daily. I'll pray for Lorraine and Peter, and I've requested uh, Catherine to pray for the youth and Steve to pray for the, uh, the financial burden people are experiencing. So let us start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of Lorraine and Peter that you have blessed our parish with. Thank you for blessing our church with the leadership and wisdom. Thank you for leading, directing, and protecting them. I pray that may you continue to bless them with your strength, courage, love, joy, and peace. May we continue to hear your voice in their preaching. May the Holy Spirit be always their mentor and guide. And they continue to thrive physically, mentally, and emotionally. Amen. Let's pray for the financial burden people are experiencing in this world.
Amen. Father God, thank you that you are a Lord who listens and answers our prayers. In 1 John 5.14, you have promised us that if we ask according to your will, you hear us. So with this confidence, we submit our prayers today. Amen. Well, it's time, now time for our testimony, and uh, we have Lindsay coming and giving her testimony today. Lindsay, please. Good morning, Kiora. My name is Lindsay, as Sue Joy said. An advantage of age is that one can look back and identify the parts in one's life when mercy and love, unasked for, undeserved, and sometimes unappreciated, changed my life. Times when I was battled on the realization that God. God as Father, Son, and Spirit. God who was as vast as the universe was and is as close to me as breath. If he was my breathing itself. And I ask myself, why did God save me? Why did he rescue me and allow me to overcome the beginnings of abuse as a young person? was God who calmed me through the dark, dank days, mired in depression so deep that death seemed to be the only escape. And this was a route I tried more than once. And then swinging from those depths to a wild, dangerous mania. How close and how often I've been teething on or near death or disaster. And then there was that offered hope. Somehow the belief and surety that I have a personal saviour, a wonderful presence that assures me, Lindsay, do not be afraid. This too shall pass. A deep burning core of knowledge that he tells me I will never give you more than you can handle. In the mercy of God, asking Jesus to mark my path, the knowledge that I have a comforter in the Holy Spirit. That is why today I'm standing here, here in front of you, exposed and vulnerable, but here. My testimony is not so much a linear listing of my life, but to tell you that Christ lives in us all and is waiting to offer salvation. I know this for a certainty. If he can be gracious to me, even now in times of darkness, if he can be gracious to me, how much more does he have to give all his people? And so when I hear God say, be still, know that I am God. My heart can sing with joy. God bless you. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, you know, testimonies, personal testimonies are a great way to encourage people who are still struggling. And if you have got any testimony that you would like to share, please come and speak to Lauren. And if you can do it in three minutes, that would be most effective. Well, the, today the questions are part of the sermon, so Donna is going to ask us those questions at the start and at, in the end as part of our sermon. So we will skip that part now. Uh, but let's go to our reading of our scriptures. So the scriptures, as we have a tradition in our church, uh, the scriptures come on the screen, and we all 
read one verse each, and by any chance two people start reading it together, please continue in that flow because God loves that unity. So let's start. The scriptures that we have today are Matthew 16, uh, Matthew 11, 6 to 9, and 25 to 30. This is the word of the Lord. Donna. Let's pray for Donna as she comes and preaches us today and see what she has called for us. Father God, I pray for Donna. I pray that whatever she shares with us, Father, may it touch our hearts. May we hear you. May we hear your voice through her today, Lord. Bless her and anoint her. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Morena Fanau. Good morning, family. So I want to start by asking you a question. The good news is you don't have to share your answer or your thoughts with anyone yet. How are you today? I'm not just throwing that one out at you. I want you to really think about that question. How are you? When you woke up this morning, did you feel refreshed after a good night's sleep? Did you bounce out of bed excited and encouraged to face a new day? Or was it a bit of a struggle to wake up? to get some motivation to climb out into the cool morning, wishing maybe that you had the extra money to keep the heater on or preset to warm up the room before you got up? Was it a bit of an effort to make your way here this morning? Now, again, as I said, I don't expect you to answer out loud. I just want you to hold on to how you feel as I share this morning. Now, you could be a little bit like Claire, who was exhausted after an awesome week of holiday program and ready for some time of recovery. Or you may have long since forgotten the need to clock watch and get up and go to work. You may even be thinking about work and what it might look like this coming week, what needs to be done, any issues you might have to resolve. Maybe you're thinking about the family or something that has been bugging you lately. At any given time, we have a multitude of things running around in our heads. Well, for some of us, that mostly isn't really an issue, but for others of us, it's not always that easy. So what does that have to do with today's topic? 
It's all right, I'll get there. Just a little patience, please. We're going to explore the theme today of My Yoke is Easy, which follows on with our bigger theme, which is practicing the presence in the present. That is to be aware of God's presence through the Spirit in our moment by moment, our day by day. And today is certainly no different. So the verses we just read, let's have a little look at them. Those first verses in 16 and 19 paint an ironic picture of poetry by children. Actually, we didn't use those verses, did we, Lorraine? That's funny. <laughs> These are the verses that I was basing this on, so that'll be interesting. Let's try this again. In the verses, Jesus paints this picture of poetry. He says that the children said, We sang, but you didn't dance. We cried, but you didn't mourn. You were unmoved. You didn't respond. You didn't care. It reminds me of an old saying, Damned if you do, damned if you don't. No matter what we do, someone is likely to criticize us. And Jesus interprets this, pointing out the way in which John the Baptist was rejected because of his lifestyle. They dismissed his message because he was too eccentric, too odd. But then they also rejected Jesus because he was the opposite. He broke the rules. He partied too much. They accused him of being a gluttonous man and a drunkard. His lifestyle, appearance, and ultimately the teachings and the persons of both John and Jesus were rejected by the Jews because neither of them lived up to the expectations that were held. In the end, they are ultimately rejecting God and his kingdom that they have been claiming to seek because Jesus did not fit their understanding of God or the Messiah. Jesus blatantly disrespects the scribes and the Pharisees, the keepers of the law, God's law, no less. Everything about Jesus seems to move in the wrong direction. And compounding this problem, Jesus manages to attract these great crowds of people, tempting them to join him in his folly. The root problem for those who reject Jesus, I think, is their awareness that taking John and, and or Jesus seriously meant that they actually needed to change their thinking, change their lives. Both John and Jesus pushed them and now us into those uncomfortable places. John demanded that we repent and move in new directions to give up that nice, comfortable life and cherished pleasures and take on uncomfortable responsibilities. Jesus turns comfortable assumptions on their heads. How, we ask, can the poor in spirit be blessed? Or those who mourn? Or the meek? How can Jesus make such ridiculous and outrageous demands regarding anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, or even how we treat our enemies? But... If they and we can find fault with John and Jesus, then their demands can be ignored. And it's far easier to criticize than to obey. And so this generation finds fault with both of them very different. But, sorry, both of these very different but compelling men. What Jesus says in these first few verses are a clear warning to the people. He wants them to listen, to consider what he's saying, and to act, to respond. He wants the people to make wise choices, to really listen, because there is a consequence to an action, to ignorance and refusal to hear. The result is in missing the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss that. 
Okay, let's jump a few more verses to verses 25 to 30. Now here we're going to see a shift in focus from those who have rejected Jesus to those who have accepted him. God has hidden the truth from the wise and the understanding, but has revealed the truth to infants. The mood also seems to change. In verses 16 to 19, Jesus was expressing frustration tinged with anger towards this generation. But in verses 25 to 27, his mood becomes more optimistic and thankful. And Jesus' optimism is based not on any recent success, but rather on God's gracious authority and the intimacy between father and son. Jesus said that you hid these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for so it was well-pleasing in your sight. That's a reflection of Jesus' personal experience. Those important people reject Jesus, but the common people, including sub-common tax collectors and sinners, flock to him. The polarity between those who reject Jesus and those who flock to him is self-perpetuating. The more that Jesus appeals to the rejected of society, the more society people reject Jesus. Infants are different, though. They are unable to go beyond their primary needs. They are reliant on others. They respond to those who care for them and nurture them. They don't have any agendas. They don't have any complex thinking that can hinder their trust. So they're open to the trust in God, open to receiving grace. An infant doesn't have the wisdom or the intelligence to make discerning decisions. They, they can't read. They can't make logical reasonings. And in this context that we're talking about, the infants that contrast the wise and intelligent include ordinary folk, those that were uneducated, those that were oppressed, those weary masses that flocked to John and then to Jesus. It also may have included those social outcasts, such as the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the other sinners. These are the infants that had a better sense of who G John and Jesus were than those educated scribes and Pharisees. And then again in verse 27, Jesus changes his focus. Again, he starts talking about his relationship with the Father. And he paints this glorious picture of this deeply intimate relationship that is beyond our knowing and understanding. And as he speaks, Jesus gives us a glimpse into the mystery of God as the Trinity. And I'm not going to go into that much more. If you want to know more because it doesn't make sense, you come and have a conversation with someone after the service. But in this, Jesus is talking about more than our mere understanding of God. He's talking about those relationships. The relationship that he describes is the relationship between himself as the Son and the Father. But as importantly, he's describing the tragic lack of relationship between humanity, us, with God as both Son and Father. In a broad sense, the Son of God came to earth so that man can be united with and know God. And the way we are able to know God is by faith. First, by believing that Jesus is God's Son, and second, by following Jesus by faith throughout the circumstances and trials that we encounter in life, that we might have life in his name through a walk of faith. This opportunity to know God is universally available to anyone who believes. Anyone can do this. God is not preventing people from coming to him. The Apostle Peter asserted that God desires all to come to him and has prolonged his coming to give more people the opportunity to come to him. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. All right, all of this 
leads us to those little gritty verses 28 through 30 of Matthew 11. Now here, Jesus offers his easy and light yoke to everyone who is tired from trying to bear the heavy burdens of the religious establishment. At the end of this dialogue, Jesus gives us a personal and astonishing invitation. It's to the infants whom the Father has revealed his Son. Come to me, he offers to all who are weary and heavy laden. Now, to be weary is not to be just tired in your body, but in your soul. It's describing not just exhaustion, but exhaustion and exasperation. It's a state of mental and emotional fatigue. It can be dull or it can be acute. And when it's felt, it increases the temptation to just give up, to succumb to apathy or depression. Heavy laden means to be carrying a heavy load, and possibly for a long time. Heavy laden is a cause for people to be weary. And this includes anxiety and hopelessness. Rest is what weary people seek. Rest restores the vigor, the strength necessary to carry on and to enjoy life. And to all who are weary and heavy laden that come to Jesus, he promises, I will give you rest. It seems here that Jesus is using the language to describe a people who are weary and heavy laden from the unbearable demands of the scribes and the Pharisees. These religious heroes of the people failed and defrauded them. They set the moral bar so high that even they themselves couldn't keep it, even though they pretended that they could. If the weary and heavy laden are the infants whom the father reveals his son to, then the wise and the intelligent are the scribes and the Pharisees that the father has hidden his son from. And later on, we'll see that Jesus condemns their hypocrisy with strong words. So anyone who did not keep their rules, the ones that the scribes and the Pharisees administered, they were shamed. They could even have been cast out of the synagogues and the religious communities if they did not measure up and meet approval. Their standards were impossibly high, and their legalistic set of rules was void of mercy. And so long, who'd want to read it? Many of the people beneath them simply and sincerely wished to please God with their lives, but they were crushed by the spiritual leaders. These spiritually oppressed people were weary and heavy laden. And their only apparent options were to keep pressing on beneath the unbearable weight or accept their rejection and live as social outcasts among the sinners and the Gentiles. And Jesus is the whirlwind that steps into all of this. But he could also be using the language of being weary and heavy laden to represent those who are burdened by living in sin. We all know that sin is an obstruction to living a fulfilled life. And Paul was very good at describing the false teachers and how they preyed on people and weighed them down. So by way of metaphor, Jesus continues to explain his offer as an appealing alternative for all who are weary and heavy laden. He says, take my yoke upon you. Do you know what a yoke is? I was trying to think of some very clever jokes with the yolks of an egg, but it didn't actually sound very good, so I decided I wasn't going to use them this morning. But the yoke is actually a harness used for the animals, for the beasts of burden to pull a cart or a plough, and often it was the oxen. And I think what, what we found about the oxen of the time was that often they would harness a young oxen to a mature oxen, a seasoned oxen that knew how to walk, how to 
pull the plow, how to guide. And so when the young one got distracted and suddenly wanted to go off and do something else, the older one would just stand there and wait for the younger one to settle down. And on they would go. And they would carry the burden together. So in essence, I think if we think about Jesus, who invites all who are weary and heavy laden to be yoked to him, this including those who are weighed down by the yoke of legalism, as well as those who are weighed down by sin or undisciplined living. It's, not, it's worth noting that Jesus doesn't say stop. He just says replace. He uses a different terminology to encourage us to think differently. And when we replace the weight of the world with the yoke of Jesus, there are two immediate benefits. The first is that we can learn from Jesus. And as we go through this life with Jesus and encounter circumstances that are new or scary to us and we want to turn away, we want to give up, we can learn from his experience to discover the best way forward. Unlike the scribes and Pharisees who were arrogant and stern teachers, Jesus says, I am gentle and humble in heart. He understands our fears and our burdens. He helps those who are yoked to him learn to live life as God intended for us to live it. He is a sympathetic high priest who has endured temptation just like we have. The second benefit is that we can find rest for our souls. When we are yoked with Jesus, he helps shoulder our burdens. When we are yoked with Jesus, we are no longer carrying our burdens alone. Like Paul, we are able to do all things through him who gives us strength. And Peter invites us to cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So Jesus' invitation to come to him was for all who were weary to set aside the heavy-laden yoke of the Pharisees and exchange for his yoke, which is easy, and his burden, which is light. Jesus says his yoke is easy because anyone can come to him and learn from him. He says his burden is light because his strength helps lighten the burden, and his burden is unlike that of the scribes or of the world. But there is a third benefit of taking his yoke, that Jesus implies with this metaphor. And I think it's this. The partnership and relationship we get to share with Jesus as we go through life together. It's personal and it's a sweet opportunity for all who are tired of never being good enough or tired of chasing the illusions of the world. Jesus' offer to all who are weary to come to him and learn how to live life to its fullest. To rest from the futile and crushing burdens of fraudulent religious systems and an opportunity to partner and yoke with him in the ventures of our lives. So I started with a question. I'm going to ask it again. How are you today? What are the burdens you are carrying? What is weighing you down? Are you stuck in the rules and regulations, afraid that people might see through the mask of peace and serenity that you put on before you came out this morning? The calm appearance hiding a raging, bubbling storm underneath. We are all only human, and I could spend a lot longer talking about that, but I won't. I just want to say that we are not alone that if we can just trust Jesus and rely on him like an infant does, no matter what is going on, he will be our lead. He will patiently wait until we stop struggling and show us the way. The deep intimacy of this relationship is clearly displayed in the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit. So today we too can live with the presence in the present knowing that with Jesus, the weight is shared and the burden is eased. I want to encourage you to lean on him 
to reach out and ask for him to be your scaffolding, the one who holds you together when you are trying not to fall apart, or even if you just need a little bit of maintenance. Let's continue to seek a deeper connection as we trust and surrender to him. Amen. Thank you, Donna. The question is, are you yoked with Jesus? Are you handing over your burdens to him? Or are you trying to deal with it, with them in your own strength? You can ponder on that question. Let's now come together and sing. Just let me say how much I love you. Let's stand. And as we sing this song, uh, as you know that we, the offertory bag is not more, no more circulated. But if you offer, want to offer your tithing, you can do that at the box at the reception. And church will be really grateful. And we pray that your tithing be blessed by God. Let's start.
encourage you please to be seated. As we've come together today and as we've reflected on the readings and the word, there are those things I'm sure that we want to bring in confession to God. So in the silence, I invite you to reflect on those things. So let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, creator of all, you marvelously made us in your image, but we have corrupted ourselves as individuals and as a church and damaged your likeness by rejecting your love and hurting our neighbors. We have done wrong and neglected to do right. We are sincerely sorry and repent of our sins. Cleanse us and forgive us by the sacrifice of your Son. Remake and lead us by your Spirit, the Comforter. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose steadfast love is as great as the heavens are high above the earth, remove, we pray, our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Strengthen our lives in your kingdom and keep us upright to the last day. Through Jesus Christ, our merciful high priest. Amen. So we pray together. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness and healing. We come to your table as your children, not presuming, but assured, not trusting in ourselves, but your word. We hunger and thirst for righteousness and ask for our hearts to be satisfied with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. Can I invite you please to stand for the great thanksgiving and I invite us to think about the words as we say them. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our delight to give you thanks and praise, great Father, living God, supreme over the world, creator, provider, saviour and giver. From a wandering nomad, Abraham, you created your family. For a burdened people, you raised up Moses as a leader. For a confused nation, you chose David to be a king. For a rebellious crowd, you sent your son, Jesus. In these last days, you have sent us your son, your perfect image, bringing your kingdom, revealing your will, dying, rising, reigning, remaking your people for yourself. Through him, you have poured out your Holy Spirit, filling us with light and life. Therefore, with angels, with archangels, with faithful ancestors and all in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. I invite you to sit as we continue in our prayers. Almighty God, owner of all things, we thank you for giving up your only son to die on the cross for us, who owe you everything. Pour your refreshing spirit on us, we pray, as we remember him and the way he commanded through these gifts of your creation. On the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread, he gave you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, he gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
We are brothers and sisters through his blood. Therefore, Heavenly Father, hear us as we celebrate this covenant with joy and await the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He died in our place, making a full atonement for the sins of the whole world, the perfect sacrifice, once and for all. You accepted his offering by raising him from death and granting him honour at your right hand on high. This is the Feast of Victory. Lord, you taught us to hope for salvation, the joy of every longing heart, and so we pray for the coming of your kingdom in the words our Lord taught us himself. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. A very warm invitation for all to come to receive the sacrament today, or to come to receive a blessing. Uh, if you could just place your hand by your side, so I know you're not asking for the sacrament. But as you come to receive communion today, let's just be reminded of those words from the scriptures this morning. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come, God's people.
above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before the Of all kingdoms, of all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no So let us pray together. O God of creation, God of our people, before whose face the human generations pass away, we thank you that in you we are kept safe forever and that the broken fragments of our history are gathered up in the redeeming act of your dear Son, remembered in this holy sacrament of bread and wine. Help us 
to walk daily in the communion of saints, declaring our faith in the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body. Now send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work for your praise and glory. Amen. And so all of our problems we send to the cross. All of our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. All of our hopes we set on the risen Christ. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Would you please be seated? So going back to the sermon that Donna gave today, uh, before the service, when the prayer team was came together to pray, following words came to their heart. This verse came, seek and you shall find, knock and it will be opened. And then there's a word that came, a picture of Jesus with his arms around us all. So again, the question is, is Jesus yoked with you, right? Well, some reminders for today, a special welcome to visitors. If you've come here for the first time, we welcome you. Please love to have coffee and tea with you after the service. Prayer ministry is available after the 9 a.m. service in the front table. There's a sad news. Um, um, if you know Bridget Tarrant, um, she died, and her funeral will be on Tuesday morning, 10 July, at the Church of the Savior at 10 a.m., all who knew her are welcome, and please be praying for her family and her friends. A uh, special thank you to all who were involved in a uh, uh, holiday program. Uh, I've heard that they had a fantastic time, and of course, Claire is taking rest now. She was quite busy with them. Um, um, soon we'll have our 125th uh, anniversary celebrations. Uh, that's on Saturday, 26th August. We are having a potluck dinner starting at 6 p.m. This will be followed by a memories time. More details will follow in the newsletter. And Sunday, 27th August, it's the following Sunday, 9 a.m., church service of Thanksgiving and celebration, followed by birthday cake, tea, and coffee. So just keep those two dates in your calendar. 26th and 27th. Let's stand for our final song.
all that need to be said is, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Christ. Amen. Let's meet for tea and coffee.